Welcome to the Dementia Land Serial Podcast, a story for everyone who knows someone living in or near Dementia Land. My name is Suska, and this is my story. Welcome to the Dementia Land Podcast, The Bathhouse. Are you okay, lady? Want me to call you a tow truck? A scraping sound against concrete was shoving my life aside. When I opened my eyes, I saw a huge metal blade that covered my entire windshield. I could barely see anything above it. A snowplow that was clearing the hospital's parking lot stopped a few feet in front of my hood. I'd been sitting in the car for some time, shaking off the cold and shaking off the events of the day. All the thoughts of returning back home, back to my studio, and back to painting sat in my head like lost luggage. I drove in the snow's darkness back to my mother's house. It seemed like just another visit at first, but it was only that morning when I left my mom's home to go to the hospital. My duffel bag was waiting in the front hall exactly where I left it the night before. I pulled the bag by its shoulder strap and dragged it behind me down the steps, a rough ride for the contents inside. I looked around for a place to sit. The room was packed with furniture. Provincials, bruised Chippendales, and Bohemian chic, mixed together unfavorably, as if they were arguing and suddenly stopped talking the second I walked into the room. Scattered about were stacks of boxes and fat bags stuffed with projects that moved about the house over the years. Projects that aged while waiting for their purpose. Boxes on top live with the delusion that something inside of them would be uncovered and considered useful once again. All the walls were furnished and there was no floor. Just a combination of rugs on top of rugs and shags on orientals. The orientals didn't seem to mind. Everything was dubiously placed, yet collectively they seemed to be part of a strange alliance. The room was quiet, the heater clicked on, and blew hot air from an overhead duck onto my face. Directly in front of me was a couch, how no one could overlook its presence. The leather couch, cut in sections, with boxes drunkenly stacked on its cushions. The center section had barely a sliver of space for someone to sit, if they were inclined to. With what little energy I had, I pushed my butt into that space. The couch moved a bit at first. The cushions took different sides, leaving my ass hanging in the middle. I was beginning to feel like one with the clutter. I sat there motionless, absorbing everything as if for the first time. I scanned the area like a detective at a murder scene. The corner of the room caught my attention first. There was an odd collection of religious paraphernalia. It took me back home to my studio. It reminded me of a canvas I had painted. It was my own Adam and Eve. I remember I had bought that canvas several months ago at the Salvation Army. It was a good buy. The painting was 36 by 48 inches. It had appeared to be layered with a number of paintings that the previous artist had abandoned. That's what made it so appealing. The painting had many lives in its layers. I felt it had traveled through many landscapes and could possibly have stood in deserts where wildebeests and zebras walked slowly in the jellied heat. Oh, this canvas was a good purchase indeed. My mentor once told me that artists must paint an Adam and Eve before they die and a crucifixion before they see the truth. It's part of the journey. 
Artists stand on the edge, focused on the fear of falling, but also with a terrified impulse to throw themselves off the cliff. Man has a choice. An artist sees the vulgarity and authenticity inside those choices in the face of his own canvas. It is a horrifying depth of responsibility. The crucifixion is the battle in our minds. Crucifying the ego, the balance of losing oneself, and at the same time staying connected with one's presence. Very important for a serious artist as yourself. I tried to turn away at first. I tightened my smile away from his seriousness. But truth be said, I openly fell into the arms of his every word. His lips moistened every message as if they were intended only for me to hear. He was my mentor, my delicious polar counterpart. We were an item in the artist community and very seldom were seen apart from each other. I left my life in Chicago years ago and moved to California to live with my mentor in his hut, originally a small bathhouse built in the 1900s. The bathhouse, a tiny box that I respectfully refer to as a hut, was loosely constructed with thin wood planks and glue. If a strong wind cared to, it would have blown our hut across the world like matchsticks in the wind. To our great fortune, the winds paid us little attention. The only door was a red worn wool blanket nailed to the top frame of its absent door opening. Loose bricks were placed on the bottom of its hang. It worked quite well keeping our huts inside from pouring out. The living space inside was modest and small in its size, a bit under 250 square feet and furnished little beyond a bed, a small desk with a typewriter and an armchair. Attached somewhere to the walls were bookcases whose crowded shelves indicated that my mentor denied it nothing. We had hardly an option but to paint outside under an overhang that lit the building. Long sheets of plastic, seamed together with clothespins, were added for protection from the cold nights and the culturally starved raccoons. We painted intensely and passionately far into the night. On one side, my mentor painted on canvases with thick palette knife strokes that were complicated, esoteric, and beautiful. On the other side, just feet away, I painted a magical world brimming with color, alive and fanciful. The space was small for creating such diverse masterpieces. Stepping back from our canvases, we often bumped and became absorbed into the parts of each other. In the early nights, philosophers, inventors, and dreamers and other local characters would drop in. For hours, our visitors circled around theories over wine and cheese. They would dissect published philosophies, and they brought their inventions and tested their applications with only one small fire that I can remember. They talked over each other, argued passionately, and laughed loudly late into the night. The Marlboros and the Camels, the Newports and the Cannabis paid no mind and simply absorbed the air collectively, enjoying the flavors of each other. <laughs> I was living in eternal happiness. I felt at home. Until my mentor's death, his heart just stopped. I moved away from the hut to a cinder block warehouse with no vines. The new studio was stronger. I took my mentor's books with me. To this day, I sleep with the life of Picasso, the works of Jacques Amedi, and the horse's mouth. They are my new mentors. The memory of that time might leave me someday, but just like my best paintings, the layers of the bathhouse, my mentor, those blessed days, has little to do with my memory or ego 
and has everything to do with who I am today and will be tomorrow. Thank you for listening. My name is Suska.